quite a lot of research is done on the timing of glacial events, uh, which is really useful context for climate change today. Uh, when did the glacial stages happen? How did they respond to warming and cooling in the past? Because um, most glacial uh, records we have today are very short, 100 years or so. So if we can look at a much longer time scale, thousands of years, um, we can input that into climate models and better predict the future. The Schmidt hammer is used for measuring the hardness of rock and we use that as a relative age indicator of how long the rock's been exposed to the atmosphere. So again, if you're dealing with glacial surfaces, <coughs> a glacial boulder or glacially moulded bedrock, you want an estimate of how old that rock is, how long it's been exposed to the air. <laughs> you can hit it with a Schmidt hammer uh, and you can apply uh, it to a calibrated curve which we've developed for the British Isles. Uh, so one way of measuring um, the timing of retreat is to look at moraines and the boulders on moraines. Let's pretend we're on a moraine right here. And the typical way which was championed in the 90s was to chip a bit of the boulder off, send it to the lab, a year later you've spent a thousand pounds per sample and you get a nice age from that. Um, and that's based on cosmogenic nuclides which come from space, do fancy things to the rock and we can measure that and predict the age. Now a simpler way to do it, or at least a quicker way to do it and much cheaper, is to measure how hard the rock is. Let's say this rock here has been exposed for 20,000 years say. It's had wind, it's had rain, weathering the rock surface and making it soft basically. So we predicted that there would be a difference between rocks that have been exposed for 20,000 years to those that have been recently exposed. So what we did, or what I did, is went around Scotland with this fancy tool, which is the Schmidt hammer, and we measured rocks that had been dated using the expensive method. So they have an age assigned to them, and we measured how hard they were and compared them. So the first step to, to uh, sampling using the Schmidt hammer is to think very carefully about where you're sampling and how you sample. So let's say we've got this bit of rock here. Um, you can sample here, you can sample here, which is the best way. The best thing to do is horizontal, um, vertically down, so uh, perpendicular to the rock surface. You want to avoid bits of lichen, because that will obviously um, artificially give you a lower score. Over here, you can see we've got uh, a crack in the rock, um, so surface discontinuity, we want to avoid that as well. So ideally a nice flat surface uh, that's smooth, um, and, and easy to sample from. So I've done this here before already, but you can sand the surface. This is a carborundum stone. You can sand it beforehand. Slightly controversial, there's ongoing debate as, as to whether that's the, the right thing to do, um, but it's certainly something that could be tested, perhaps by an undergraduate going around sampling uh, both uh, tested and uh, untested surfaces. So let's say we've done all that. We've decided this is a good place to sample. Simply press the Schmidt hammer down, uh, two hands, one at the bottom, one at the base, slowly down and you'll hear uh, the piston engage. Uh, and this uh, fires up here so it rebounds up to the value which is 48 and if you want there's a button on the back which you can press and then you can take it off and easily read it. Uh, in terms of each individual surface there's also uncertainty as to how many measurements to take. Um, I've settled on 30 per surface so um, that gives you a good uh, sort of a number to work with. You can see if there's any clear outliers. Um, and then the next thing is how many surfaces do you sample? Um, I've also gone for 30 as well. So lots of data to play with.